And welcome to everybody who is here. This, is, this, can, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Welcome again to you all this morning. Are there any announcements before we begin, before I introduce Mark? Jim. I think I can be heard. Um, this afternoon, Mel Burks and Suzanne Lupian will be hosting a reading at 4 o'clock. Um, and it's all original pieces. People won't be reading other people's work. They'll be reading poems and prose of their own. And everyone's welcome. Here. Here. Oh, it's important. Here. <laughs> right here. Right here. Right in this very spot. 4 p.m. again? 4 p.m. 4 o'clock. And yeah. it might be dark, but come in. <laughs> Does daylight savings time change today? It doesn't change today. No. Not quite. Yeah. Then you had an announcement, I think. I did. Uh, I'm not going to be here next weekend. I'm going to be at a college visit. So we wish you good luck. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks for letting us know. I do have one announcement about Lord's Acre, which is coming up. It will be an online auction again. It is well underway in terms of gathering stuff. And we have, a, as always, a lot of good stuff and a lot of good baked stuff and other stuff. Um, if anyone would like to donate something, please contact either me or Jeanette or June Salsa. Um, that will be starting, the actual bidding will start in sort of mid-ish, late-ish November, and it'll run for a week and a half, so we'll let you know more about that. Any other announcements? Okay. Then I would like, it is my great pleasure to welcome Mark Kudalowski, another Algebraic Road neighbor. We've had a lot of Algebraic Road people during these last few months, and you're another one. <laughs> uh, Mark comes to us as a shepherd, a sojourner, a seeker, a lot of S's, <laughs> and a scholar, the fourth S. Um, and he is going to talk to us today about spiritual cosmology and the rediscovery of heaven. And he is, I think, well suited to talk to us about that. He's done a lot of good thinking about interesting stuff. So Mark, please come up and join us, and we'll, we will light the peace candle. Christ was life, and the life was the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Let us pray for peace and the things that make for peace as we light the peace candle. And our first hymn is in the Red Book, 544, like the murmur of a dove song.
First reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Seek the Lord, while he may be found. Call upon him, while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. This is the word of the Lord. For our second reading, we have a responsive reading of Psalm 84 that is on your paper. And so I'll read in the bold, and then I invite uh, the congregation to read in the lighter print. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. For the Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless.
Second reading is from, or sorry, third reading is from the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building made from God, building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan under our burden, because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. The one who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. This is the word of the Lord. We've finished a, a building project here, so I'm going to use, I find this is a very good notepad, <laughs> less likely to lose it. Um, yes. So as we begin um, this reflection, the topic is spiritual cosmology and the rediscovery of heaven. This is a big topic. Um, we're going to be stepping back and taking a broad view of things. So I'd like to pause first for a moment, and I ask for your prayers for uh, for me, um, for the message that this may be one that comes from the Holy Spirit, and um, for grace as we we go together into some some deep and somewhat challenging waters. Living God, we trust that you are present here among us. I ask that you guide the words of my mouth and each of our hearts to be present, that we may receive what is good and true and of life from you, and that what is in um, might be an obstacle to that life, and we can uh, be patient with in my limits and failings, um, and that we may all be open to your spirit and be nourished this morning. Amen. So I'm going to begin with some um, statements that are going to sound quite discouraging. And I hope as we go over the arc of this talk, it's, it's all in the service of life. Uh, but to begin with, um, I'm convinced, and maybe you um, are too, having looking around at the, at the news and sort of the signs of the time that we are in a period of crisis. Um, and I would say that the, the ancient, um, ancient thinkers, um, certainly within the Christian tradition, would have said that we are in apocalyptic times, which doesn't mean just a one final end of the world, but the, the Greek word means a time of revealing, the unveiling, when, when patterns and often patterns of, of um, imbalance and injustice are, can suddenly be seen for what they are. And so I'd like to, to mention a few of those, and then we're going to try to poke a little at, at the source here. Um, so first, um, in this time of decline and destabilization, we're all, I think, or many of us are very aware of uh, destruction of the natural environment, of the, the limits of the Earth's resources, of issues with uh, climate destabilization, um, with uh, overproduction of, of plastics that are both, you know, clogging the oceans and increasingly find out clogging our own tissues. Um, we seem to have this issue of, of seeking the infinite in the finite and, and wanting to consume more and more even as our, the, the world is being devoured by that. Um, we have uh, decline and destruction of of bonds of relationship and trust first, and this is over a course of several centuries, but a decline in the harmony and the sort of interdependence of family in the broader sense of, of clan down to the nuclear family, and then that itself beginning to, to um, fracture more and more. Um, decline in, in community coherence. Um, every place where human beings are different from one another in the last decade or, or more, um, an increase in discord and difficulty being present in love across differences. That includes political differences, racial differences, um, differences in regards to both sex and sexuality and gender, 
um, you name it, um, in an area where we are different from one another, it seems to be getting harder and harder for people to come together, at least in the public spheres. Um, it's not true of everyone, of course. Um, in our country, there, prior to COVID, the statistics said that one in five adults were um, either diagnosed with or were, would have been diagnosable if they had treatment or um, with a mental illness. That number raised to two in five after COVID than the years after COVID with the isolation. Here in Vermont, recent surveys have shown um, that among uh, young adults, I think the age range that they surveyed was, was around you know, mid-teens into college age, 18% um, had made a suicide plan in the last 12 months. 18%. Um, and statistics I've seen from Dartmouth and the mental health department is um, somewhere around that range, actually a little bit higher. Um, heavy, heavy things. But when I talk about being at an end of an era, this is what I'm talking about. And that last aspect about mental health, what I want to say is we are a people that have become dislocated. That is that we no longer know fundamentally who we are and where we are in the cosmos, in the broadest sense, what the philosophers would have said. That our place in the great order of things. And all of these problems, any one of them we could isolate and want to set up a task force or a nonprofit or an effort to try to address. And those things aren't bad. I'm not criticizing them. They can relieve a lot of suffering, and they have over the years. But what happens if we peel the, you know, the onion skin back a little bit, we look a little deeper. Where is all of this coming from, this sense of, of dislocation? Um, I'm going to add to that um, that in terms of our, our worldview, um, there's been an, a significant stagnation in the physical sciences in terms of theoretical advancements for about 100 years. Um, things that are not understood well include the origin of life, what consciousness is, um, what happens when we sleep. Um, Oh, um, visual perception, like how it is that actually like what we see becomes what we perceive um, and how that all works within us. Um, and of course, something I'll return to a moment is the presence of miracles, like what happens when things bend or obliterate the laws that we think we can set up in a mechanical way about how everything works. Where's the space for that within our worldview? Um, there isn't one. And I want to give a, a quote of uh, Albert Einstein related to this. Um, it says, all of our science measured against reality is primitive and childlike. We still do not know one thousandth of one percent of what nature has revealed to us. It is entirely possible that behind the perception of our senses, worlds are hidden of which we are unaware. You know, some crazy man with wild hair who looks like he might be homeless, right? Crazy Al. No, Albert Einstein, one of the, you know, the, the foundational figures in the 20th century in terms of understanding the nature of reality. We do understand less than one thousandth of one percent. And yet, in our cultural push over the last several years, there's been an increasing uh, inability to actually look broadly with you know, kind of angry yells from a place of fear, you know, to trust the science. Instead of saying, let's use this tool to explore and try and understand the world around us, knowing that what we understand may be incomplete, useful, but incomplete, and to continue to open to discover. So this is what I talk about when I talk about a civilization in crisis, a worldview in crisis, and why. What's going on and what does uh, faith, what does religion, what does spirituality at its best have to say about this? Because, of course, our religious traditions also in this time of crisis over the last 150 years have increasingly taken on a fundamentalist nature and have lost their sense of curiosity and ability to explore mystery, wanting very hard answers. So Houston Smith, this great scholar of the world's religions, said that Western civilization, and he's referring to the last roughly 400 years, is to his awareness, and he studied this perhaps more than 
or among the most of anyone that I've, that I've read, um, Western civilization is the only society that has viewed the material world as a closed system. That's the difference between us and other civilizations and between our past, is that only in the past roughly 400 years has the idea developed, strengthened, and increasingly become, in a sense, a fundamentalist tenant that this is all there is and that things have to be understood within a closed system. And I'd say that we are, we are towards the tail end, I don't know how long it's gonna go, of this 400 year experiment. What happens if we pretend that we are only in a world of matter? This is not a new idea. Democritus in fifth, sixth century BC in, in Greece came up with the idea that all the world was just tiny material particles bumping together, the first concept of atomization. He was considered um, wrong, and he was considered a, a heretic within the schools of philosophy, and his philosophy was marginalized for about 2,000 years. Uh, it was revived um, with the thinking of uh, people like Rene Descartes, um, and then uh, advanced in, into conceptions of Newtonian physics, which originally people like Descartes and Newton didn't say that there was no spiritual world. They just they started by saying we can explain so much by how the you know understanding the laws of motion and how particles work and react to one another that we're going to say this is a whole system that can be understood and god is out there somewhere this is deism god is out there god set it all up and then just watches um and of course it wasn't that long you know, within a century of working under that system that people that were just looking at the physical world thought, well, maybe this is all there is. Maybe God isn't even necessary to set it up. So we go from the idea of the clockwork universe, again, you know, the world being made in the image of our machines that we were developing at the time, um, with a clockmaker God to saying the clockmaker is not necessary, it's just the clockwork. And of course, in more modern times, as we spend more time building and developing computers, we shift from saying it's a clockwork universe to saying, you know, human beings are just really advanced computers instead of saying we're really advanced um, automatons, which was the earlier notion. So we continue to look at ourselves in the world in the image of our technology. Now you can find articles saying, oh, is the, is the known world really just a computer simulation? You know, is it all just a metaverse. <laughs> um, this is serious questions in, in philosophy right now. So in all of this, um, I'm reminded of that famous quote by Nietzsche, who said, God is dead and we have killed him. And I want to hold that quote next to a quote from, uh, from Paul in his letter to the Galatians, where he said, God is not mocked for whatever we reap, we sow. So we have sowed a world where we imagine that God is dead. And what that leaves us with, I'm gonna hop traditions right now over to Buddhism, because I think it's a helpful framework for this piece. We are left with a world of pure karma. And in Buddhism, the concept of karma is the law of cause and effect. That is the only thing in our philosophical systems we believe can explain reality is cause and effect. This thing happens, therefore this, this then this. And that's the basic of a materialist physics and an understanding, which can explain a lot. I'm not saying that that's not real or true, that, that there's not tremendous predictive value in that Newtonian style physics, but we pretended that that's all there is, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, and we forget you know, in the Eastern system that Buddha's whole message was how to liberate oneself from the confines of cause and effect to open into a realm that is beyond, utterly beyond that. And in the Christian tradition, when Paul and other writers talk in the scriptures about sin and its consequences, its cause and effect, and then he says there's something else that breaks us beyond that, which is grace, which shatters those laws. And you see it all throughout Jesus' teachings, things that where there's grace and mercy and love that goes beyond all the common laws of cause and effect, whether that's referring to physics or in laws of the heart, the cycle of vengeance. I do this, you do that. Jesus steps in 
universal forgiveness, universal compassion, brings a new reality, as it were, from beyond, or we might say from above, these are all metaphors, of course, but from another realm that breaks into this, this flatland world. So, in this modern worldview, we've developed a place where there's no place for the transcendent, or what we might call vertical causation rather than horizontal causation. No place for the supernatural, and therefore no place for God. Uh, one of the things that, realms that I've been interested in looking at over the last few years as I've been exploring this, this topic is what was going on at the same time as some of the, the architects of this modern Western worldview were developing their thinking. So along the same time as you know, approaches like Freud in psychology, um, mentioned Nietzsche in philosophy, um, Darwin in evolutionary biology, or proto-evolutionary biology, as these systems were being developed, and not, again, that they don't have explanatory power but as they're increasingly being said, this is all there is. One example, um, a very dramatic one, is there's a man named St. Charbel Marcouf in Lebanon, born in 1828, died 1898, uh, lived first as a monk and then as a hermit in Lebanon, not Lebanon, New Hampshire, but <laughs> Lebanon uh, in, the, in the Middle East. And he uh, was incredibly devout, incredibly focused in his spiritual life and cultivation. He lived uh, about a third of his life as a layperson, a third of his life as a monk and priest in community, and then the last third as a hermit in more or less ceaseless prayer. And things began to happen as Charbel's spiritual life advanced. Um, one of them was that when he would bless holy water and then use that holy water, um, things would happen. <laughs> um, when the community a couple times ran out of grain, they, Charbel would go into the, grain, the granary, bless the room, he would leave and close the door, the next person that would open the door would find it filled with grain. Um, not unlike Jesus Christ and that multiplication of the loaves, and of course Charbel's whole life was committed to trying to stand in that same spiritual energy and power of Christ. Another one of his blessings was that when locusts were coming into the region, uh, Charbel would go out into the, the fields and sprinkle holy water um, on the fields. And after the locusts would pass through, it was like a Passover. <laughs> um, the areas where Charbel had blessed would remain untouched. And so after this happened once, that you know they sent him out. As soon as they found out, he blessed all the monastery grounds. And the monastery was a sea of green, um, a, a region of desolation. The governor of the region that he was in, or the mayor, I forget which, but one of the local officials actually contacted the monastery and said, hey, next time we hear about locusts, we're calling out Charbel. And for the rest of his life, that would happen when there was a surge of locusts. They would send Charbel out to first bless the monastery grounds and then bless as many fields as he could in the surrounding community. And invariably, as many fields as were um, blessed would remain untouched. Again, doesn't make sense if we think of this as a, con as a tight physical world, only cause and effect, only matter bobbing around, but it happened. And in this case, it pu was a public record and a public policy of this community in the late 19th century. Um, when Charbel uh, passed away, his body was, um, or I say his grave site was noticed by people as there was light emanating from it and people continued to go to his gravesite, his body um, remained without decaying for about 70 years, and it was a site of pilgrimage and many miraculous things um, happening. Again, doesn't make sense, but it happened. Um, right now in Missouri, there's a, a Catholic nun, Sister Wilhelmina, whose body was found after two years to have been undecayed, um, and in a similar phenomena, um, again, in seeming contradiction of the supposedly unbreakable laws of um, biology um, and decay, but there it is. <laughs> um, my point in saying this all is not to try and force the issue, but just to say that there are things that are going on that Einstein would have observed and said are wonders that are beyond what our science can currently explain. It does not need to be an insult to science. It just invites us to expand the aperture just a little bit. Um, or as St. Augustine said, 
Um, miracles are not contrary to nature, they're contrary to what we understand about nature. It's an invitation to grow, to widen our worldview. Because when we don't, when we share in this collective delusion of our time, some part of our hearts knows that we've been given a raw deal, that reality and that our own reality is bigger than what we collectively agree to narrow it to. And to me, that lies behind much of the crisis of our time. So, what did the ancient world, and in particular the ancient Christians, understand? They believed in that we were a tripartite person, meaning that we had body, this physical outer form that we can touch, a soul that is an inner life that's personal, unique to ourselves, and that's manifest in our thoughts, our emotions, um, dreams, imaginings, and our relationships, a soul, um, and then a spirit, which is our participation in the infinite and the divine, which is beyond our individual form, but that we can share in. So we are creatures that are body, soul, and spirit, or um, soma, psyche, and pneuma, if you want to use the Greek words that are in the New Testament. But similar to this, this understanding of the human person as sharing in the infinite, also having a uniquely personal dignity and worth, and having this outer form expressed, the ancients believed that we live in a tripartite cosmos. And this is key to my whole message, whole reflection here, is that just as we have three parts, or these three faces, the universe has three faces. The outer, which is the corporal world, or we might say the physical world of matter. And then there's what we might call an intermediate realm, a realm that is neither physical nor utterly transcendent, where subtle forms, some groups would call it the subtle realm. Um, this is the realm, again, of, of dreams, of imagination, of intuition, of things that we participate, that it's, it's not physical, but it's, it's bound in time, but not space. Um, makes any sense? And then the final is the, the, the of eternal or the transcendent realm that is bound by neither time nor space, but that undergirds all that is, which you might call the realm of the spirits or the realm of the heavens. So we have this heavenly realm, we have an intermediate realm, and then we have the physical outer realm. And that's part of why the ancients understood each human being as a microcosm. That is that you and I and every human being have within us a mirror or an echoing of these three aspects of reality, the spiritual realm, the subtle realm, and the physical realm. And so human wholeness and human fulfillment comes from participating in each aspect of reality and having a relationship with each aspect of reality. That's where we find our rest and our wholeness. If we go and decapitate the cosmos, so to speak, in our mind, not in reality, we can't do that. <laughs> but if we pretend that the spiritual realm doesn't exist, then we're going to feel like something's missing. Or as St. Augustine, Augustine again would say, our hearts are restless. We are made for you, O Lord, and our hearts remain ever restless until they rest in you. We have the eternal in us. We long for a connection with that eternal presence. And then finally, of course, that's mirrored in the Christian ancient understanding of the Holy Trinity, is that God has expression or life in the utterly transcendent realm, God is creator, um, or God the Father, in, the, in the, the Trinitarian understanding, which isn't about the maleness, but it's about the, the being the source of all. Um, God the Son, or the Word, um, that is God present in the imminent, God entering into physical form, into matter, um, expressed in matter, and then God the Spirit, who moves between the two who interfaces between that which is most imminent and which is most transcendent in God, so that God is met in each of these three realms if we are open to encountering the presence of God. So we have a tripartite human being in a tripartite or cosmos in a Trinitarian deity all woven together. That is the world that our culture came from. Um, and 
I'm not saying the medieval world, for example, was perfect, but people knew who they were and where they were and where they stood. Um, something that we have lost. And this, by the way, this isn't just um, in, this is not just something that's present in the, um, in the Christian world. Uh, the ancient Hindu cosmology had a very similar sense of a triple world, of a material world, um, a subtle world, and a spiritual world. I, forgive me, I forget the, the, the words in Sanskrit, but you can, you can find that in Hindu philosophy. You can find it in the Taoist understanding of the human person having three essences, jing, or the physical blood and um, physical energy, qi, or, or kind of bioenergy, or kind of more subtle energy, and then xian, or spirit. Um, so many cultures came, up, came upon a similar observation of the nature of the human person, nature of the human world. Um, so um, let's look at the Christian story in this context. Because the Christian story begins not with a narrative of continuous progress and ascent, um, as the modern worldview has, has, would have us say that what humans are in the process of, but of course with a story of being created in goodness and perfection, and then the fall. Um, so before I get to my poem, um, in the fall, what we understand in the, the Christian story is that what happened was that there was a rupture, a rupture in human consciousness. I mentioned body, soul, and spirit, but a rupture between soul and spirit. And so what happened is we lost the easy, free access to the spirit realm, and instead soul, or our, we might say our consciousness, our individual personality, sense of self as an individual, turned in upon itself, turned away from the transcendent, into being, we might say, um, excessively drawn to attachment to things that are in the outer world of form. Um, what the Buddhists would call attachment and aversion. Uh, what the Christians would call idolatry. That is, that is and the Jewish, Jewish tradition would call idolatry. That is seeking, we turn to seek ultimate fulfillment in things that are finite. So in matter, in objects and physical sensations in relationships in inner experiences anything that is finite that we think we're going to get that ultimate sense of ah, of rest and peace in that's what i'm talking about that's the understanding the falls we turned and now we're excessively grasping here 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 and there and that's been a problem for human beings for as long as we know as long as we can imagine that that human condition has always been there the bigger trick or the bigger challenge of our cosmology that's been collapsed over the last several centuries is that we believe that we'd finally gotten powerful enough that we could really do it. We could really get that lasting fulfillment in the material world by just acquiring more things, consuming more, or you know, hence the massive cons consumption which is destroying the planet. Um, we thought maybe if we just design the perfect social system, if we make it perfectly based on logic, which they tried to do in the French Revolution, or based on perfect social equality, which they tried to do in the communist revolutions, it always never quite worked, did it? There was always some, out, there's some group that didn't quite fit in enough that maybe we'd get our utopia if we just eliminated them. And each of these movements ended up in the, the murder of millions of people. Didn't quite work was not based on an accurate understanding of the human person or of our problems. The problem is not out there. The language of faith, and actually all authentic spirituality says the problem is here. If we don't address the rupture within the human heart in our relationship with the eternal, we're not going to be able to find it by trying to fix things out there. Again, it doesn't mean that we can't do some good out there in specific locales, but as a whole, we're not going to create the perfect system until we enter into the realm of perfection. And at that point, we don't even need to create or manipulate the system. Uh, we enter into wholeness. So we end up with this addictive or compulsive relationship with things on the surface, and which, of course, spirals into a further inability to access that transcendent realm, that realm, that heavenly realm where 
rest is actually found. Uh, Denise Levertov has a beautiful poem about this. Again, talking about the story of the fall from Genesis. Adam, where are you? God's hands palpate darkness, the void that is Adam's inattention, his confused attention to everything, impassioned by multiplicity, his despair. Multiplicity, his despair. God's hands enacting blindness. Like a child at a barbaric fairgrounds. Noise, lights, the violent odors. Adam fragments himself. The whirling rides. Fragmented Adam stares. God's hands, unseen. The whirling rides dazzle. The lights blind him. Fragmented. He is not present to himself. God suffers the void that is his absence. A poetic, imaginal way of understanding this rupture. So in response to this, the story, the central story of the Christian faith of salvation is a restoration of unity between body and soul and spirit. That is that which has been rendered returning and becoming whole. And so this healing, this turning back, is the central message of Jesus' teaching. It's the Greek word metanoia, to, to open the mind and heart to that which is beyond our um, the surface of things. Um, I translate the word metanoia as transform the eyes of your heart. Jesus is teaching, transform the eyes of your heart for the realm of heaven is at hand, here and now. Now is the appropriate time. He's saying, wake up, it's already here. And so the important thing about understanding metanoia in Jesus' teaching, that this happiness, rest, peace, fulfillment, final human contentment comes in heaven, and heaven is not a place it's not something in the realm of form, and it's not in the future. It's not bound in time to a specific location in time. It is a coat, and it's not even a state of consciousness. You hear people sometimes talk about that. Oh, heaven is a state of mind. No, you may have a state of mind that helps you to recognize it, but it's a coterminous realm, that eternal realm of that triple cosmos that is always here, that is always present, if we have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, the heart that is open, that is able to perceive it. And healing and human wholeness and restoration in this tradition comes from the conversion or the, the healing, the transformation of soul that we may again enter into that easy union and communion. And, and Christ's teaching is about how to do this. And then the whole um, message of his sacrifice is about a way that it may be done, and then his promise of the Spirit to bide with us is to guide us and to be with us and accompany us and be an agent of that restoration and union. That's what the story's about. So entering into this coexistent realm that's always here, always present, I mentioned metanoia as one aspect, that transforming of our eyes and heart. To put it in a little more modern terms, the key, I would say, to this is to learn to seek spiritual goods spiritually and material goods materially. Or in the scripture that, that I'm in my church we listened to last Sunday, to give to God what is God's and to Caesar what is Caesar's. That is that the whole problem with that, what I've called the, 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 the consciousness of, that we get after the fall, is that we turn looking to outer things to provide goods that can only be provided by that union with spirit. And if we recognize that, we learn to cease striving in the outer world. Doesn't mean we don't need to feed ourselves and house ourselves, but we seek that which provides rest and or we seek our security in the realm of God, in this transcendent realm. And we seek our limited partial physical needs and emotional needs and relational needs in the limited physical, emotional, and relational world. We no longer demand ultimate goodness or perfection from other people, from social institutions, um, from physical things, even from our own emotions. Because increasingly as we learn to abide in the transcendent realm, 
the rising and falling of emotions no longer trouble us so much. They can still be there. We're not getting rid of anything, but we're allowing them to find their proper place in this uh, tripartite cosmos with all aspects of our being. So what is partial and passing can be partial and passing within us. Good, but not something we attach undue importance to. And our rest can come in the one realm where true rest abides in this divine realm or this transcendent realm. So um, another, just final thing to say, another practical way, how do we do this? Um, in addition to recognizing where we're seeking the infinite and the finite and learning to let go of that is simplicity. So to simply do less, to have more space, to increase our direct contact and interaction with the physical world, with nature, um, removing ourselves from re increasing realms of abstraction, whether it's time online, uh, social media, um, worlds where um, there's a constant promise of, you know, you know, if we could just get rid of this person there, change that opinion, whatever. Just learning to slow down enough to be still, um, we can begin to then do what uh, the early church talked about is opening the book of creation. We can begin to see in nature, in the natural world, some echo of its divine and transcendent source and be drawn from gazing upon the beauty of a sunset into that which, where it comes from, metaphysically. Not just physically, but metaphysically, that we can be drawn by the natural world into um, an intimacy with its creative source. And from that, we find rest, we find simplicity, we find peace. We're able to be at peace with one another because we see other people as coming from the same source. No matter how different they may look on the surface, we're no longer attached to the surface. We find peace in our relationship with the natural world because we may still need to be fed, but we don't need to find all of our meaning in the outer world of consumption. We can be present with less, we can be present with gratitude and wonder. So as we rediscover heaven, we rediscover the way to live in peace with one another and with ourselves here on this earth. Uh, may we strive to do so, amen. Thank you, Mark. Um, we are now going to sing together in the again in the red hymnal number four oh eight, the gift of love.
So it's time now for our little mini Quaker meeting. Um, five minutes of silent meditation slash prayer slash reflection slash connection, however that works for you. Um, I'll let you know discreetly when five minutes is up. Um, and please appreciate these moments. And please now listen to the words of the benediction from Philippians chapter 4. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. <laughs> 